with we're here today with our fourth guest um and it's Suzanne Barrett Howard am I pronouncing your surname yeah, uh, okay. correctly yeah, Suzanne that's fine. yeah that's fine oh, oh. yeah Okay, um, and Suzanne is joining us uh, from the British Council in, in Paris, is that correct? Yes, that's right. <laughs> great, yes. great. Uh, and uh, I mean, Suzanne has a wealth of experience um, in her in her area. If you uh, take a look later at the handout and, and at her, her task as well, you'll see she's written a lot for the publisher Multilingual Matters. Our topic today and her speciality is bilingualism. She's written books on this, many articles, and participated in lots of conferences on bilingualism. She's interested in multilingual teens, uh, adult classes, and she's also worked with young refugees as well in England. And now she teaches in the British Council in Paris. And she is a parent of bilingual uh, mm -hmm. children. So I mean, she's got experience from her own life of supporting language transfer, backing up language learning with cultural knowledge. And um, yeah, she's the perfect, perfect, perfect person to, to finish off today. So the title of her webinar are, is The Challenges and Benefits of Teaching English to Bilingual or Multilingual Children and Teens. And welcome. Uh, Suzanne, how are you? Thank you. I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> it's okay. Too. Great. Yes. Great. So I will be here if you need any help, Suzanne, but um, uh, you can start sharing your screen yeah. and right. we'll come back at the end for questions. So right. have thank a great you. webinar. Thank you. Okay. Yes, I'll, um, So just let me know if you're able to see that okay yeah it's just just loading now i think it might just take one or two seconds we can see okay. you we can hear you and yep yeah, now we can see the screen great okay a little bit of uh interference with it with the internet here today but yeah well so welcome everybody to my webinar so thank you very much it's very interesting listening to amy and victor and amina and um, picking up little little uh tips and advice from their from their webinars as well so thank you very much the great team Good. Um, so I'm going to talk today about the benefits and the challenges of being bilingual uh, and multilingual as well. It's a huge topic, I have to say. It's very difficult to cover everything in such a small time. Um, but I'll try to give you a little taste of it. And perhaps for those who uh, perhaps are new to working with bilinguals or multilinguals or perhaps just want more information, hopefully it'll give you a flavour of what you can what you can perhaps incorporate into your classes. And there's lots and lots of information out there to find uh, afterwards if you want to do some more research on the topic. OK, so we'll begin. So just a little overview of my talk today, uh, but I'm going to do a little overview of the research on bilingualism. Um, we'll look at the, some of the challenges, some of the benefits, and at the end, I'll give you some takeaways for your classroom that you can test out in, in your own way. Okay, so just going to begin with a little bit of history of what's been happening in the world of bilingualism. Um, so yes, in the 1930s and 1950s, um, bilingualism was seen quite as a negative thing, mainly due to some IQ testing that was done on bilingual children, which they scored quite badly, uh, obviously because they were not ready or not prepared, or it was in, in a strange language for them as well. And so that led to some quite negative beliefs of bilingualism, and it was a, a disadvantage um, that was, that was taken for, for quite a few uh, a few decades. Uh, in the 1960s, research was done into language acquisition and better designed tests, specially designed tests, being able to compare children like for like. And there they wanted to prove that the bilinguals were similar to the monolinguals, but actually they found that in some cases the bilinguals perform better uh, in some situations. So that, that started a whole new uh, field of research into linguistics. 1970s, uh, we learned about how children mix and about how children put their languages together, how they build up their, 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 their group of languages together in their world. And so that was interesting as well. Um, I came in at the end of the 1990s, 2000s, when I did my research 
And that was when the MRI had just come out and we were able to measure bilingual brains and, and to see the, the right and left hemispheres, uh, which was seen to be active. So that was quite interesting, uh, interesting um, direction as well. And most recently, well, we are continuing on the idea of cognitive processing and the bilingualism advantage for both children and for adults as well, and about how learning two languages can help you over all your life, possibly help um, stave off things like dementia and um, but, you know, keep, keep the brain active in many, many ways. So it is becoming more of a long term project now, not just for young children. And um, we're still learning lots of things about language separation, language uh, anxiety and how we use languages in everyday world. OK, right. So that's a little bit of history there for everyone. <laughs> OK, so we're going to have a look at some terms which are used in the bilingual world. So um, does anybody know what this word, this meat, what this signifies, OPA? If you know, put your answer in the chats and we'll see if anybody has an idea what it, what it means. You may have heard it if you've done some reading on the topic. Yeah, thank you, Karen. Yeah, well done. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Top of the blog there. Okay. Absolutely. So that one one parent, one language. Uh, this is a strategy which was uh, very, very popular over perhaps the last 20, 30 years. The idea that one parent speaks their one language, the mother speaks their language, for example, the father speaks their language, and the child has a very separate idea of how these languages are. Um, this works very well with young children, um, perhaps a bit more challenging as they get older. And it also depends very much on whether the parents understand each other's languages as well, because children are very sensitive, they can pick up very quickly on uh, what's going on within, within the family family organization okay next term that we often hear about in the research is native language what does that mean to you when we hear the word native language in terms of bilingual children what do you think that could mean i'm just checking the chat at the same time The native language, yeah, the one you're thinking, yeah, the most dominant language as well. We're going to talk about that in a minute, yeah, yeah, the first language, yeah, good. Okay, we often use that term as, as well as, as a, yeah, for language learners at different levels, as, as Victor was talking about you. Okay, thank you, lots of different ideas, that's great. Okay, our next one, yes, yeah, so the native language, yeah, a definition of that would be the one, yeah, perhaps we are most comfortable with, perhaps the one we're most fluent in. Um, perhaps the one we use regularly as well. It is it is a question which people often ask, what is, what is your native language as well, to, particularly for bilingual? Good. Okay, our next one. Oh, sorry. Our next one is mother tongue. We've mentioned that today in several times it came up in the other seminars. Um, what does that mean for you when you hear the word mother tongue? Let me think about that. Yeah, I'm just checking the chat, see what's coming up there. Yeah. Yeah, so the idea of mother tongue, yeah, the language, yeah. Language learned at home, home is quite important for that one, yeah. Yeah, okay, I don't think. Bargains picking up on the L1 as well. Yeah. Great. Yeah. The mother spoken to a baby at first. Yeah. Thank you, Pavela. That's great. Yeah. Okay. So that's, uh, yeah, very good little definitions there. Thank you. Um, it is sometimes in the world of bilingualism, I might say this should be a father tongue as well, perhaps <laughs> or other tongues. It's perhaps a little bit limited, that one, but it is something that we do here. And people will, again, the bilinguals are often asked, what's your mother tongue as well? So it's quite a, for them, it is something they are familiar with hearing that, that's expression. Okay, um, let's look at our next term, expression, mixed strategies. Anybody know what this could be, the mixed strategy? Got a little clue in the word there. <laughs> it's not the father tongue. No. Yeah. Mixed strategy. Many languages, yep, yeah. uh-huh. Mm -hmm. using mixed languages yeah 
bilingual. Yeah, it is. A, it is a form of bilingualism. It's a way to be bilingual. Yeah, parents for two different languages. Yeah, definitely. Could, that's part of it as well. Yeah, many techniques. <laughs> yeah. Okay, to listen differently. Yeah, that Cam Cam Camelia, thank you. Yeah, a strategy children develop to communicate with different interlocutors. Yeah, that, that's great. And so, yeah, that's the idea. So uh, in many families, as the child gets older, we may start with a one parent, one language approach. But it, over time, it becomes not very practical when people are coming and going at different interlocutors, different people are, are in part of their life. It's not always uh, technically possible to only speak one language all the time. You might uh, you might find that you're perhaps, you know, uh, you're just doing it for the sake of it rather than actually um, doing it for communication. So it is, I think children often feel that and prefer to have a mixed strategy. However, the mixed strategy does involve um, parents being able to speak and understand the language as well, otherwise it doesn't really work. Okay, cool. Uh, another one, got two more. The next one is dominant language. I think you probably know what this one is. It's probably self-explanatory. But again, feel free to, to give a, a definition of what it means to you, the dominant language particularly for children and teenagers. Hmm. Yeah, it could be the mother language. It could be the mother language, yeah. And Ellen has picked up on the L1 as well. Yeah, the most used, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, communicative language as well. Yeah, the most commonly, and yeah, yeah that's right. Well done, because it can be heard. Yeah, thank you, Aram. It could be heard or spoken language as well. Great, thank you. Yes, this one is a bit of a, it's, it's obvious, but also maybe it's not as well, because it could be the most dominant language at home, it could be the most dominant language in the society, it could be the most dominant language in the child's life as well, uh, from different people. So I suppose if you if you sort of did a calculation of how many hours a child was learning a language, that would come out as, as the dominant language. So it's, uh, it, and it can be very flexible, we might have different dominant language in, in different days or different weeks. So it, it's flexible, that one. Okay, and the last one, I think the last one will be no problem for everyone, but just to be a little refresh, it's the L1 or L2, which again, we've heard that a few times today in our, in our seminars, webinars. So yeah, I'll just double check the chat, see if you, anybody's not sure what it is, feel free to. Yeah. Yeah, the most used language, yeah. First language, second language, yeah. I wouldn't use it as level one. It's more it's more language. The, the L is for the language, yeah. Language one and language two, yeah. Great. Yep. That's great, yeah. So we often use this one because we don't necessarily want to refer to which language we're talking about. So we'll just say his L1 or, or her L2. Uh, sometimes it's just not necessary to give that information. We don't, we don't actually need it. It's not important. Great. Thank you, Nancy. Well, thank you for your, your help there. I'll just put a little summary of them so you can have a look at what we talked about and uh, the different terms which are quite useful to know if you are working with with it bilinguals and multilinguals there they are okay we're going to go a little bit more into detail on the mixed strategy because this is something which i'm particularly interested in perhaps as, as a parent and also a teacher as well is the idea it is very 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 hard to separate the languages completely and to only have one language we do try as much as we can when we teach at the british council to only speak in english and, and as many times i'm saying only speak in english please um but it is not really very real and sometimes you know sometimes they want to make a joke or they want to add something Oh, they have a throw a little expression. So, uh, so there are some some strategies which the bilinguals use, often unconsciously. They don't really think about it; they just do it. It's quite natural. Um, so yeah, we've talked about the mixing, but we might have bilinguals who code switch, who code mix, and we can also use that term translanguaging as well when in the classroom. Um, let's have a look at these words together. Do you know what code mixing means? What do you think code mixing means? Yeah, let's have a look in the chat if you know. These are quite specific terms that we probably, probably not know these every day. I'm gonna check the chat there. So code mixing. I'm not sure what it is now. Okay. Okay, common words, possibly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, yeah. Was that tis, tis way? Thank you. Using different languages in the same sentence, that's right. Yeah, that's right, so yeah. 
using different languages in the same sentence. And yeah, as Maria Luisa says as well, mixing L1 and L2 is part of that. Yeah, absolutely. And what, yeah, so that's the, that's the code mixing. So the code mixing, often we're just throwing in one word or one little thing. We might be doing it in a, yeah, it might be in one sentence. We might be just adding in a word just for a little definition. Uh, it might be a word which is perhaps difficult to translate or doesn't translate. Um, yeah, so yeah. So it's a, I think, as I said, it's foreign words, but sometimes for bilinguals, it's, it's not really necessarily a foreign word. It's more just a word which is more comfortable. And so they will sort of throw those into the conversation here, then everywhere. So if you're listening to them, you might be thinking, mm, what are they doing here? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so to answer your next question, code mixing. So code mixing is different from code switching um, because code switching is a bit more of a chunk of language. So think of it like as a, as you might begin speaking in one language and then for, I don't know, one minute and then switch into, into another language for the second half of the sentence. Um, yeah, it can be, yeah, as, as Elena says, it can be an easy option as well. Sometimes it's easy as well to use that for, for the children. That, that's absolutely true. Um, yeah, so example, yeah. so code switching, if you might just, well, code mix, you might just say, yeah, today I went to the boulangerie, just throw that word in instead of saying the bakery, just throw it a bit, that's a bit lazy. And then you might say, yeah, I went to the, I went to the boulangerie today and, uh, and yeah, they had those financiers, uh, so the financiers que j'aime bien. So just continuing that in French, because you've already started in French, you've already used that French word, you just want to continue. It's much more natural to do that. Many bilinguals do that around the world. It is completely normal to do that. However, we do need to understand those languages. So often bilinguals will be very careful not to do that in a situation where there are monolinguals uh, listening or, or participating. And yeah, as, as Maria said, there's a lot of cognitive effort. They have to actually switch there. So yeah, absolutely, yeah, and we do see that in other languages as well. It is, it is, it's just quite, uh, quite normal, as I say. Yeah, uh, great. And then translanguaging. Well, this is a relatively new term which has come up, and uh, I don't know if anyone knows what. If anyone wants to give a definition of what that means for them, anybody have a definition of what translanguaging translanguaging means? Possibly. Yeah. Thank you, Pavla. Yeah, she's changing an example there. Yep, using the whole linguistic repertoire. Thank you. That's that's great. Yeah, that's that's a very nice definition. Yeah. Yeah. Alternately as well, deliberately in a class. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we've got it. Yeah. I think as well. Yeah. The term Steve. Oh yeah, they do seem overlapping. There is a lot of overlapping between it. I do agree with you there. Yeah. Okay, it is quite a new one now, so that's not a problem if you're not sure about it. Um, so yeah, that's the idea. So translanguaging, we might actually perhaps show a document uh, of, of one language uh, and read it in that language and then ask them to discuss it in another language or perhaps watch a video in one language, perhaps a, a first language, ask them to discuss it in a second language. So it's a technique that can be used in a classroom to encourage that. So I think it's important to know about these code switching and code mixing, perhaps just to pick up on that in the class, if you hear somebody throwing a word in or switching halfway, um, perhaps just, yeah, just, just listen to it and say, and, and admire it, because it is actually quite a clever thing to do. It's not necessarily easy, and bilinguals don't even think about it. It just happens very naturally to them, depending on who's there, who's who's next to them, and they'll pick up on, on, on the body language and what kind of thing they think is, is the right language to use with them. Great. Okay, so talking about our bilingual and multilingual kids. Um, yeah, so obviously, lots of languages are learned at home, but also we're learning languages in a school environment as well. So let's have a look at the places they can learn their languages. I've got some examples up here. So we've got immersion, where it would be literally immersed like a swimming pool in there, um, only speaking one language. And then dual education, and then we could be learning a language as a second language, as a, as a more practical um, situation. Um, I think, as Melissa said, I was working with refugees, so they were learning languages as a second language, as a very practical language. And then we could also be learning a language as a foreign language. Uh, and for many bilinguals uh, and multilinguals as well, they might be learning an add-on foreign language at school, which could make them, it could be a, a third or fourth language as well. So that, that's, that's important to think about as well. They often have lots of languages in their lives. Great. Okay. So let's have a look at our question. What do you think are the challenges of being bilingual or multilingual? And I did get some replies already through the survey. Thank you very much for those answers. But perhaps just take a moment to put um, in your opinion, what do you think are the challenges? 
okay, or being bilingual or multilingual. What do you think? Well, they could be, you could be putting um, something which personal experience says, or it could be something you've heard about perhaps, or perhaps seen. Yeah, that's great. Forgetting the language, thank you, yeah. Confusion, pronunciation, yeah. It would be mixing language while teaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. So mixing language is coming out as a challenge, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Interference. Yeah. Lack of vocabulary. That's very true too. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Really good example there. Okay. Yeah. We will look at the benefits in, in a while as well. It's not just about the negative state. Don't worry. <laughs> Those you're saying, it's, there are some good things. Um, yeah. So let's go back. Yeah, so those are exactly examples of challenges. Sorry, Michael, a little bit of problem with my screen is just uh, charging gently and slowly, but it's coming. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. I just feel free if, if somebody has given a good reply, feel free to give them a thumbs up and say you agree with them as well. You don't, you know, there's lots of great examples out there. That's fantastic. Okay, so what we're going to do now, we're going to have a look at um, some examples of children. And um, I'm going to ask you just to have a think about what you think is perhaps their, their challenge for them and, and how you could help them as well. What could you do to help that person? Imagine you were perhaps teaching or perhaps looking after that child. What would you do to help them? OK. So we've got a little case study here. I'm not going to read it out. I'm just going to let you read it on the screen. Um, so just take a, take a moment just to read it and think. What do you think is a challenge for, for this, this boy, A? Um, you may have one challenge, you may have two challenges. Um, it's not a test, don't worry, just to find out if you can identify some of the challenges that typically bilinguals and multilinguals have. So as I say, take a few moments to think about that and how you could support that child if, if you were looking after them. I'm just having a look in the chats. Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you. Pavlis' school refusal, yep. <clears throat> Blocking vocabulary as well. And thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so ideas, yeah. What would what, what could you do? Is there something you could perhaps do to help this person, this young person? Uh, yeah, what would you do? Emotionally lonely or <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. <clears throat> Discouraged, yeah. Lack of enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah. School buddy. That's a nice one, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I speak to school now. for some watch yet. I think that's that's a good one. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so you're all absolutely right. Yeah, well, you are definitely on the right track. Um, yeah, you kind of feel it. Perhaps he's feeling a bit lonely. Yeah, he needs to, perhaps someone to help him a little bit as well. He is losing his culture. Um, yeah, so that, that's the idea that, yeah, he maybe he needs a little bit more help. Okay, so yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk about this a bit later, but the idea, just bear in mind, if you remember this, this situation, particularly about helping his siblings with the homework uh, and going home as well and having a, a sort of second role at home. So yeah, so that's that's a challenge there. Okay, let's have another challenge. See if you can find out what is happening in this situation. Again, just take a moment to read it through on the screen. Take your time and think, what do you think could be a challenge for this girl, S? What could be going on for her? And again, how would you help her? It's a tough one, says Pavlo. <laughs> it's quite subtle, this one. Yeah. 
who could help us. Yeah, so bearing in mind that the student has got definitely already able to speak both languages and, and they're mixing at home as well. And yeah, as Arian said, yeah, she don't think she's making mistakes, but she, she's, uh, yeah, I think the mistakes is the issue here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, take it easy. <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, parents must hire a proper tutor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, great. Uh, interesting comments there. <laughs> That's right. And yeah, thank you, Amy. Yeah, uh, absolutely. The, the vocab in some contexts will be more developed. That's what's really happening here. She, even though she's hearing both languages, she's probably missing a bit of context here. And also she's been criticized um, by teachers who are saying that she's making mistakes, which, which often happens as well. And that's probably due to her age and her knowledge of those two languages. So yeah, she's not able to, to perhaps be at the level which is expected of her at school. Great. Okay. And... Our final one, um, again, what could be a challenge for this child? More of a, a skill challenge, how you could help that person. Some people did give me some advice on this in the survey. Um, yeah. What do you think, you, how could you help this boy? It's not all bad news, but there's a little challenge going on there. <laughs> okay, any more ideas how we can help? Yeah, free writing, right? practice writing at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, focus more. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, interesting idea. Yeah, support with it. And it's a, yeah, that's, that's a nice one as well. Record himself speaking. Yeah. And phrasing. Great. Yeah, lots of practical advice there, I think. Is that daily writing, maybe writing it? Oh, diary, maybe diary writing. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah, reading English books as well. Yeah, that, that's often advice that we, we would give. Yeah, great. So you've identified very much his challenge is the writing. So he's, you know, he's doing doing really well with his speaking, not a problem. Um, but the writing is a challenge. And also, yeah, possibly he needs to read as well. We don't have all the information, but possibly we would recommend. Yeah, recommend. Yeah, as Aaron said, yeah, they're, they're worried about looking, finding the perfect word. They are paralyzed. Yeah, a lot of pressure. Good. Thank you. Lots of advice there. Yeah, <laughs> we all think we all agree that you get start reading as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, so it's going to run through some of those issues that we've seen in those mini case studies. So as you can see, a uh, preschool and primary and teenager, we expect very different things. I just did a quick Google search. I don't know if this is correct or not, but basically, uh, a preschooler would be expected to know about a thousand words. Uh, a primary school, uh, about 10,000. And by the time we get to, to the beginning of uh, secondary education, we're expecting them to know 50,000 words, which is quite amazing if you think about it like that. So it is probably no wonder why um, bilingual struggle to sometimes to, to be at the same level as, as everybody else. There may be some challenges for them to, to perhaps to collect all those words in the same way, depending on how much time. Uh, they have and depending on what kind of perhaps education system they're in as well so I think it is yeah quite important to perhaps not to expect too much so when I was teaching teenagers sometimes I would have to sort of go back to some primary concepts of how to do something how to perhaps write a letter or a, a diary excerpt um, or something quite simple like that which you think a teenager would know but actually if they haven't had that if they haven't had those those things spelled out to them in primary then it is really hard so I think we need to really bear that in mind that bilinguals yeah we, we we, we should not expect them to be exactly as they are age-wise. It is quite challenging for them. Okay, um, a little, little hedgehog here. I've got some comments here of what a teacher might say. Now, I, I took these comments from things I heard in the staff room. It's not, I've been writing reports this week. These are not reports. Um, but yeah, struggles to read a book, um, finds this thing hard, cannot write an essay yet, chats all the time but can't write much. <laughs> a lot of children like that doesn't understand grammar rules, spelling is awful and brilliant at debates. <clears throat> so you may recognize some of those comments. Um, they may sort of ring a bell with you. You might think, oh yeah, I've got children in my class like that. 
Um, yeah, perhaps you've had experience of that before. Okay, so we do, we have re referred to this as sometimes as a spiky profile, so you can be very good at something uh, and perhaps, yeah, finding other things more challenging. And I think what's important to say about this is that sometimes children can be, bilingual children or multilingual children can be actually quite bored in class. Uh, they might have absolutely no problem to, to speak or to listen. It's very easy for them. So boredom can set in. And other times as well, they can try to overcompensate uh, by perhaps encouraging more discussion, more debates, and trying to avoid those things they don't want to do, perhaps like maybe the grammar rules, perhaps depending on what language it is, um, or it could be the writing an essay, it could be that. There's, there's things they actually don't want to do, they will compensate. Okay. Yeah, so that's that's the, something to think about when you are when you are teaching them, and to bear that in mind that um, yeah, we can have a spiky profile when we are bilingual. And we saw that in one of our um, mini mini case studies that we saw that, that one of the one of the children was uh, Jay, Jay was actually struggling to do both to do the writing and to speaking. It was a real challenge for him. And we saw in the first case study about the child who was helping his siblings at home. And this is quite a normal situation, by the way. Um, and we're going to talk about, yeah, being the unpaid translator. Um, so sometimes, yeah, bilinguals and multilinguals have told me clearly that I expected no two words for everything, which is quite a, a demand. Um, classmates and friends asking for words, being the teachers of certain in some classrooms, being asked to, to take on that role. Um, and having to take on translation jobs and tasks at home. In some situations, obviously not, not everyone have that, but maybe just simple as perhaps um, translating a recipe or a letter or a document or perhaps writing back to, uh, to a teacher. And uh, I had that when I, when I first came to live in, in France with my children. I had to very carefully read all the information that was sent out from the teachers. What were they expecting me to do? What did I have to sign? Did I have to send something? What was the information they wanted? And I would sometimes check with my kids and say, what, did, what am I supposed to do? Uh, so it's quite important to bear that in mind as teachers, and educators, that we do need to think about the parents' first language. And yeah, are we, are we perhaps creating problems by making it too complicated uh, or perhaps expecting too much of them as well as, as, um, as unpaid translators? Great. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm going to move on to our last slide in this section. So I think, uh, as, as I think probably, you know, everyone's aware of, we all know somebody who said to them, yeah, I learned a language when I was young, but I, I lost it along the way. So yeah, typical story of the bilinguals and multilinguals is over time struggling to keep using that language. I use the word struggling because it is a bit of a struggle. It's sort of, yeah, they, they, they may try and then, yeah, it's just not able to, to keep it going at, at the level they would like to have it. Um, they may stop when they physically leave a person, a place, a home or school. That can happen as well. That idea that uh, it's very connected to, to a certain place, uh, as sometimes even emotional connection. Um, they may be able to understand a parent's language, but not reply to them in conversation. So, you know, perhaps around the dinner table, they might be understanding everything that's said, but they can't actually go back and have that conversation, probably because they don't have enough vocabulary or, or the skills to to to, uh, to reply back to them, but that can be very frustrating. And unfortunately, yeah, sometimes we do have country and school languages which take over, uh, and and there could be a shame of using the other language as well, possibly in in situations. And that is uh, something which has been well documented in the research as well. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our first part, which is about the the challenges. So let's have a look at some of the the good things. So. This is the second question to ask you today. What do you think are the benefits of being bilingual or multilingual? So put your comments in there as well. Um, have a look. And what do you think? And again, I hope yeah, I've already had some already, but maybe you can add a few more in. What you think are the, the benefits, in your opinion, of being bilingual or multilingual? Yeah, I'm great communicate more people, enjoy more songs. Yeah, that's important. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, expressions, more expressions from John. Yeah, great. Broaden your mind. Yeah, mm, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, lots of opportunities. Broaden your mind. Yeah, jack of all trades. I like that. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Yeah, there's lots of things, but maybe not 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 specialized. Yeah, 
Great. Okay, thank you. I think we've definitely got some lovely answers there. Were, feel free to thumbs up people who you think are particularly yeah, good answers there. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to skip that one just for time, but yeah. So we have um, yeah, these are some positive, positive benefits. Um, and if, if you just have a quick look at that, take a, just a, a moment to have a look at that and think what benefit has she got? What's, what's the thing that's uh, good for her through using two languages? What do you think for her? Pregnancy development, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So for this for this one, for me, I think uh, yeah, the benefit is that she's got able to that connection with her family and that she's able to, to go there and stay there for one month and not have a problem. And yeah, Paulette gives an example that she actually did that. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, the idea that yeah, people can um yeah, people around them can support the language, encourage the language and make it very real in their life. Yeah. Great. Yeah, she's trilingual. That's right. Yeah. Okay. okay. And then another little, little boy here, young boy, eight years old. Um. Yeah. Benefit for him. Yeah. Lots of good answers coming in there. Okay, yep. So it's nice and easy. I just want to think, yeah, his his benefit is quite clear that he's got the ability to be able to read books in, in double in each language. Um he's enjoying it as well. He's looking for a little challenge. And he's able to to bring that to school as well with his with his book reviews. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. That's right. So I think probably some of you are quite familiar with it with the story. Like, yeah, you can be a good writer, says, says Jessica. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hope so. Yeah. That's good. All right. And our last person. Um, this person is 14, so they're a teenager. And uh, they lived in Australia for five years. Yeah. Could be a good translator, interpreter as well. Mm. That's nice. It stretch his mind. Yeah, actually, I will not actually have a child in my classes doing this. <laughs> it's actually making videos. Um, so, yeah. Great, yeah. Intercultural awareness, yeah. Thank you. Link to our last, our last webinar. Yeah, great. Okay. Thank you. That's all good. So, as you can see here, yeah, capacity to, to be able to do things, perhaps to push yourself a little bit more, to have access to, to, more, to more things. Great. Oh, well, thank you, everyone. Okay, so as we've seen, uh, the positives are yeah the ability to to be comfortable and to to have strong relationship with with the the, the cousins, the grandparents, the new friends, perhaps to to spend holidays together and have time together. We've seen that in the case studies. Um, yeah, the cognitive benefits. Many people have mentioned that as well. Um, yeah, more open minded have come up, can fill in the gaps. Um, accept your more way thing, two or more ways of saying things and transfer those skills across as well to be able to. So if you can read uh, something in one language, you more chance you can get the idea of doing it in another language as well. Not always, I have to say it's not always, but it is put, there's a, a higher chance there. Great. And this is the bit I think is important. A bit of exams. Obviously, our children need to take exams at a certain point. Um, yeah, we just mentioned it. I just mentioned that getting a job in the future, and often to get a job, we probably need to do some exams or studies. So bilinguals do have um, an advantage: the fact they have a facility to pass exams, wider cultural knowledge, quicker thinking. But I have to say, in my experience, um, they do still need to prepare and be ready for an exam or test. Um, it's not possible just to jump in there and just take that test. So I think, yeah, a bit of, bit of preparation is still needed. Don't underestimate that. If it really is going to be a problem, you feel that child is going to 
you know, not, not do very well, maybe we need to think about a different kind of test uh, or, or test in, in the first language as well in that situation. Great. And yeah, we need to have fun with words. Bilinguals are often playful. They pick up on funny or strange detail. Um, they enjoy copying accents, dialects, acting role plays as well. Um, and they are quick to pick up new expressions or words. So that is one of the one of the good things which has been noted for a little bilingual. Right. Um, and now I would just like to give you two takeaways that you could use in your classrooms. This is adaptable to all different ages. So um, feel free to adapt it. Now, this is a quite complicated one, but this is an idea of mapping your languages. Um, so yeah, you can see here that the orange English is here, and then a Korean, a Taiwanese, the TV shows, um, Persian is here in the center. And then these, these ones are around. Imagine you've got family connections here. Um, and then watching different TV. So I think it's a lovely exercise. You can do it on the board. You can do it on, on, a, on a piece of paper. You can do it as homework, uh, so do bubbles of where you use your language. And it also gives you an insight as a teacher as to where your, the, the child is actually using languages and, and, and uh, perhaps to get some insight on how you could help them or perhaps encourage them in different ways. So uh, there's a link to that in the handout. You can, you can have a look at that, but I think it's very easy to replicate for all different ages. Don't, don't worry, it's an easy one. And the second one is drawing your languages. We've got a little body here, um, and this is an English teacher. She's talking about her languages that she uses, French, Turkish, Bahasa, Indonesia, and Italian. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what do you think it would be? What do you think she would say about these languages? What would she identify with? Do you have some ideas? And what it would mean? Oh, thank you, Melissa. Thank you for the link there. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, anybody got any ideas of what these languages mean to her? In a very, this is a very physical way, this one. It's not necessarily what she's doing. It's more it's very physical. Body language. Yeah, it is body language. Body language is important. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, think about body language, French body language, Turkish body language, Italian body language. If anyone's Italian, you might have an idea. Yeah, that's good. Well done. Yeah, hand movements. Yeah, great. So I've put this in the handout, but I will read it out for you just so you can have an idea what I'm talking about. So she says, French is in my brain and eyes. I learned it at school so I can read it well and speak okay. But it's easier for me to speak when nobody is French and we use it as a lingua franca. We don't worry about mistakes in grammar or pronunciation. We just go for it. Turkish is in my eyebrows. A tiny up movement is no. Italian is in my fingers for gestures and hand movements. I notice my mother and sister use their hands and arms a lot. Uh, and also point, which seems a bit rude to me after living in many places where this isn't done. And Indonesian is on my back. It isn't polite to show when you leave a room. Everyday greetings are on my mouth, my tongue, and in my memory. And she says, it wasn't easy for me to read Indonesian colleagues' faces or understand what they were thinking. So that could be, uh, again, perhaps a little exercise to do um, with young children. It could just be a little body. Uh, how do you see yourself? Uh, do you see yourself as sort of, yeah, 50-50 or 80-20, perhaps different colors for different languages. Uh, for teenagers, you could be interesting to, to write more details about yeah, how and when do they use those languages in different places. Okay, so I will just a little, just a little summary there, yeah. So recommendations, uh, keep up to date on the research. Uh, obviously there's so much out there, but you, know, you can find lots of research on linguistics through LinkedIn. And uh, yeah, other other YouTube as well. There's lots of channels on there where you can find up to date information. Um, recognize the challenges of being bilingual. Yeah, sometimes look at the kids and say it is not always easy. You know, everyone says it is, but it's not always easy. But on the same time, celebrate the benefits of being bilingual and make or draw a language map in your class if you have a possibility to do that. That'd be great. So I'd like to say thank you for listening. And if you want to find me on LinkedIn, thank you very much, everyone. That's great. Hi Suzanne, thank you so Hi. much. Um, that was really, really, really great. I, I enjoyed it loads and I just love the last activities. They were so beautiful. I love, really love the, the body and um, drawing your body, uh, uh, where the languages fit in. Yeah, it's great. It was great. <laughs> Have you tried it with a class? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, we did. We definitely tried. We tried those. Um, 
Yeah, we've also tried, they talk about your name as well. That was another one too. I haven't put it up there, but you can oh. explain the story of your name. That 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 generated a lot of discussion. Um, they, they went yeah. home and interviewed their, their parents. Where's my name? Where did my name come from? So that could be a little connection as well with that one. Well, that's really nice. It takes it home. It takes it to somewhere else as well. And actually, yeah, I mean, if I was to do that, I, I don't have, uh, actually, my, my first name, Melissa, is is from Greek, even though I don't have any um, Greek heritage, but it would allow everyone in their in the family to find out um, yeah. where their yeah. name came from, even if they don't have any parents or grandparents yeah. from other countries. No, oh, I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, we've got lots and lots of uh, thank yous in many different languages in the chat, which Aww. is lovely. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, you. And and uh, let's take some questions from the people who are watching. So if you're watching on Facebook, you can write us a question because I can see it. And if you're watching on Zoom, you can write a question here because uh, Suzanne and and I can see it. Um, so uh, let's. Um, Let's take one one question that I can already mm -hmm. see that I think is kind of a key one. Um, and it's from Mincha Anna, or maybe Anna Mincha, mm -hmm. maybe. And she mm -hmm. said she asks, what educational tools or teaching aids uh, do you think would be useful in a multilingual setting? Mm -hmm. Like what could teachers take to class to to help them yeah. um, if they've mm -hmm. got a big variety of kids in the class? Yeah. Um, it really depends on the languages. It really does. And I also think we need to adapt a lot as well. I think you need to adapt to your class. Uh, I'm using yeah. quite classic yeah. British textbooks at the moment in Paris, but uh, you need to adapt it. Yeah. I think as we've talked about a lot today, mm -hmm. the idea of picking up on what your audience, what, what the class needs as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there, there might be some things which are not suitable as well. You might you might just like to take things out or put things in. But I would encourage yeah, people perhaps to to write things as well, or perhaps to ask the class to to give ideas mm -hmm. what they'd like to talk about as well. Um, but yeah, but you can definitely use a classic textbook as as a base. But I would I would adapt that along the way. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, uh, and I guess I think about like. If, if the person who asked the question, if Anna was thinking about physical things you could take into the classroom, well, if maybe al allowing mobile phone use for dictionaries to find yeah. out words, to find out more, um, maybe that's something that could be done. It, I know that yeah. depends on the school mm -hmm. policy, though, doesn't it? It does, um, yeah. But I think I think maybe the idea is perhaps to encourage those languages as well, and, and not to not to sort mm. of ban them in in the classroom. Say it's okay, yeah, it's okay. And you do a presentation about something which is important to you, perhaps a um, you know a sport or a hobby. It's okay to to use words from that other language. It's really fine to to do that. I think mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's that's really that's really great to be to be celebrating uh, all the languages mm. in the in the class. Yeah, I read a piece of research that says that, I mean, every kid in a class will benefit from having people from another culture uh, yeah. talking about their culture because they'll learn something about yeah. their Yeah, they're, they're their curious. Neighbor. They're curious, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, uh, so let's see if we've got any other questions. Um, uh, Ahmed Shwat, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his uh, surname correctly, um, asks, could you please explain the concept of dominant language again? Uh, and that was mm. kind of quite near the start. Maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe he mm. missed that start, that part. Yeah. Sorry, it does sound quite self. Okay, okay, it's dominant language. It does sound quite obvious, um, but actually, it is quite subtle because it could be the language which is dominant at school, or it could be the language which is dominant huh. at home. And so I think the way I would explain it is sort of, you know, if you had to actually look at all the hours in the day and perhaps that, that mm -hmm. bubble idea as well, like which language are you, if you're drawing your bubble, which one is the biggest yeah. one? And and we saw that the, the orange bubble uh, was the biggest one. So that, that's probably, probably the best way to describe it visually. Um, yeah. Which one is, is most present in the child's life? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Thinking of it, it as hours is is a, a really good way to 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 do it. Mm -hmm. Definitely, 
and uh, mm. who they spend their time with as well. I, I've done something like that in a class and I found out information that I didn't know about the class at all. <laughs> I found out <laughs> about a, a French grandmother that I didn't realise oh, yeah. uh, and I found out that a, a child took uh, takes um, uh, Arabic classes at the weekend and, and yes. I had and I had no idea. So yeah. doing that yeah. activity in a classroom, something similar, it was yeah, kind of writing a a, a, pro, a language profile um but I love the bubble ideas it, it really taught me a lot that I didn't expect to to know a good activity that's right mm, really yeah, was good um uh, let's have another question uh there's oh oh well, there's a question from Zara Manur and I, I know uh-huh. this is a big question. Let's let's see your opinions, <laughs> but don't feel pressured, hey, Suzanne. Um, and she says, how can she overcome the challenges as a bilingual teacher herself? Because I I guess that being a bilingual teacher has um, challenges and, uh, and and benefits as well. Yeah, maybe Zara's so teaching. Yeah, maybe mm. she's teaching in a class, uh, in a monolingual class. They know she talks their language perfectly, but she's mm. trying to focus them on English. Any tips? Mm. Uh, mm. Yes, I suppose it depends very much on the situation. But yes, there, there, there are lots of teachers in that situation who are yeah perfectly bilingual, um, but may choose not to perhaps show that, perhaps in the beginning, yeah. depending on, on the age group as well and how comfortable you feel, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I think because I'm working with bilinguals, so in that situation, it's kind of it's it's acceptable. Um, but I think it, perhaps if you were teaching, you know, perhaps young learners or perhaps you know beginners, it might yeah they, they might expect you to be the translator all the time. So that mm-hmm. possibly could could be a challenge. But you know, if if you're happy to do that, that's okay as well. I think it's fine yeah. to to do that to say I understand you know what you're saying and and that's okay if you want to ask me a question if it's uh yeah it's gonna help yeah yeah I guess like setting boundaries and saying I can help you in this language for this yeah. type of thing yeah. but oh I want you to but do we are here to learn yeah so some children could yeah. be really uh, could be quite confident by that as well I think it's a great model as well mm-hmm. it's a fantastic model to say look I'm your teacher and I know what it's like to speak to your languages so I think that's mm-hmm. a great model for children really Definitely, if children know more bilinguals, the, yeah, the, yeah. Well, the, be- the better, the better they get interested in other languages, yeah. and that's a good thing. Um, uh, Fazaliki says, great session, thank you so much, and I want to say the same, um, we've run out of time, Suzanne, um, and I, we had a really great time, it was a, a wonderful thank presentation. You. Thanks for all your support and help, yeah, thank you. Yeah. And thank you audience for all the participation, it was fantastic, um, you were great, especially the people who've come to four webinars today, that was incredible. <laughs> um, and thank you to all the other presenters that we've had today, to um, uh, Amy, uh, then to Victor, and then to Amina, and thank you to Joanna Gore for setting this up and thanks to Marcus and Karen and Wiam who've been moderating in Facebook. So have a really great evening everyone and we hope to see you next month for the next event which is about pronunciation. So take care everyone. <laughs> Bye. Goodbye.